We haven't even scratched the surface when it comes to talking about caches. There's a bunch of things that we want to talk about still, some of which were our advanced topics, so we're not going to touch on them this time, but let's kind of wrap up a couple of loose ends. I was mostly telling you the truth when I said that every line of the cache contains two elements. There is the tag, and then there is the block of data that is, re that is retrieved from main memory. Turns out there's a third component, and this third component is actually pretty important when it comes to successfully operating a cache. And that is a set of flags that's associated with each line of the cache. Now there are four in particular that I want to talk about. We talked briefly about how with set associative, you can have a bit that identifies um, if you've got two-way set associative. Remember, there's two lines per set. You can have one bit that identifies whether if we need to replace something, should we replace the first line, zero, or should we replace the second line, one. So that's kind of a flag, some additional information, a Boolean setting that helps us use, helps us use that particular line of the cache. But it turns out there are some others. And let's go ahead and mark these up. So first of all, we've got T, which stands for type. Now understand that everything that's in the cache came from main memory, but there are two different things really two main classifications that identify what kind of information we've retrieved from main memory. And basically, we can identify this with type. And that's, that tells us simply, is it data or is it an instruction? Because it turns out, and we'll talk about this in a later, uh, in a, in a later lesson, that I treat data differently than I treat instructions. So, instructions, for example, when I bring those in, I need to decode them to figure out, well, what circuits to energize in order to perform the action that's indicated by that instruction. So, there's a couple of things that you might also want to save along with instructions. Now, instructions, you should never write to them. Instructions should just be, should just be read and executed. Data, however, doesn't get decoded and it does have the potential for being written to. We'll talk about writing to a cache in just a moment. Um, so these guys are handled differently and it's nice to be able to have some indication for each line as to whether it's in, containing data or instructions. Now you may say, well, what if it contains both data and instructions? The way we have, uh, the way we have our operating systems and, and the execution of our code set up, you should never have data and instructions straddling a block. Um, and, and, and let me try that, try that a different way. The interface between data and, and an instruction should not occur in the middle of a block. You should have a block that contains either all data or a block that contains all instructions. Let's talk about another one. We'll talk about a V bit. Now V stands for valid. And it's basically identifying whether the line contains valid, well, elements from memory. All right, so valid elements from memory. Now, whenever, think about it this way. Whenever you have started up the processor, it's pretty, the cache should be empty. When you first bring it up, there should be nothing in the cache. So all the lines should be marked as invalid. They should all have, you know, depending on whether you have a zero or a one identifying valid and invalid, more than likely you've got a zero identifying the fact that, every, that, that it doesn't contain valid data. And so a real easy way to clear the cache to just basically say, okay, we're starting over from scratch is just to set all the valid bits to invalid. Um, there is a problem with that though, and we will talk about it in a minute, is that if the, if the cache, if the line of the cache contains data that has been written to, that is updated, but we haven't updated main memory. In that case, we need to make sure that that data gets updated to main memory before we invalidate a line or else we're going to lose that update. All right. There's another one, L, and this stands for lock. 
And so we can lock a line of the cache to prevent replacement. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, it turns out that there are some pieces of code or some blocks from memory we don't want to get rid of. We don't, you know, because, for example, like in the operating system, we don't want that, that to ever be replaced because we know for the, for the entire time this machine is on, that's going to be, that, that particular block of code is going to be used. Think of it this way also. Uh, oftentimes, especially when you get into really high performance things, you want to make sure that certain critical pieces of code never get flushed, never leave the cache. If you lock it, that way we know that that particular line of the, of the cache will never be replaced. Um, and, and in the last lesson, I talked about how, you know, if you have set associative, that sometimes, or direct in that case, uh, the lock bit may actually act a little funny. For example, with the ARM processor, you've got four-way set associative. So there are four lines associated with one set. And so there are a bunch of blocks that get written to just those four lines. That's the only home that they have in the cache. Well, what if you have locked all four lines and something needs to go in there? Well, the ARM processor actually has a mechanism that says for, or at least certain versions of the ARM processor, if all four of the lines of this four-way set associative cache, if this set are locked, we just unlock automatically the first line, all right? The last one is one that we wanna focus on though. It is called the dirty bit. It is a flag that into, it basically identifies a line of, and I'm going to put down data. This is not the case for instructions, but data that has been written to. But not updated. in main memory. All right. Why is this important? Well, the dirty flag is incredibly important because if I have some sort of data that I've modified, you know, consider your program being actively, your program is actively updating variable values, right? And those variable values are getting updated in the cache. Well, what if something comes in and says, I need to get rid of that line, I need to replace that line, and it just so happens that that line's the one that got selected to be thrown out. Well, we don't want to throw out the modified data, do we? So we take a look at this data bit, this D, excuse me, this D, this dirty bit. And if it is set to a one, we know that we need to update main memory. Now, this brings us to the concept of cache write policies. Now, cache write policies are important because they can affect the performance of your system based on which write policy we, we select. Now, the, the write policy, one of them is called write through. Now, the write through policy says, you know, we're not even going to pay attention to the fact that we have a dirty bit. We're just automatically going to store every store to the cache writes through to the main memory. So every write to the cache also writes through through to main memory. All right. Now, that is kind of sounds really safe. It sounds like, oh, well, I'd like to do right through because it's safe and it means that I'll never accidentally replace a line and stomp on the data that I had updated. I'll never lose a variable value. Yeah, except there's a problem. The vast majority of time, we're not going to, you know, the vast majority of time, we're not going to be replacing that block and it'll increase bus traffic. So, so the interface between main memory will start to become, become congested with all these write-throughs. Now, 
On the other hand, if I've got a multi-core processor, I've got a mul multiple, multiple processors, multiple CPUs that are all sharing data, and one of them modifies the value in their cache, nobody else knows that. They have their own copies in the cache or they're reading main memory. How will they know that main memory is up to date? So sometimes write through is really important whenever it comes to shared data. And so if, if four, four cores are all sharing one piece of data, all the caches watch the main memory and they watch to see if anything that's in their cache is getting updated. And if it is, they invalidate their line by setting the, invalid, setting the valid bit to zero. They invalidate their line so that the next time the processor comes to get that data, they need to reload it from main memory. That is an advanced topic. We'll talk about that later, but it's called right through with bus watching. All right. Now, the other type of write policy we have is something called write back. Now, write back says update main memory only when a dirty line is to be replaced. All right. Now, that reduces bus traffic. It reduces bus traffic greatly, but you lose that right through with bus watching where if you're sharing data, somebody may start updating or working with a, a variable that is not the most recent version because another core has it in their dirty line, right? Now, let's talk briefly about this type now I haven't talked, you know, talked too much about data and data and instructions. And when we get into assembly language, we'll start dissecting data and instructions and how that's all organized in memory. But it is actually it plays a pretty important part whenever it comes to our processors. And the reason for this is if I have my microprocessor, so there's my microprocessor and it communicates with a cache. Now, what we've been talking about, and, and we hinted at when we were talking about the memory hierarchy, multiple levels of cache. So you have a cache called level one, which is really close to the processor, and then you have a level two, which is a little further away, and it may actually be shared by multiple processors. Every single processor's L1 cache, the level one cache, is pretty much unique to that processor. They should have their own. They may share level two. Now, one of the things about the cache is that it's feeding functionality of the processor. So you have an instruction decoder which says, okay, what's the next instruction to do? Let's figure it out. Let's energize the appropriate circuits. Then you have another part of the processor that says, okay, I need to process this data. I need to bring it into my registers. I need to add, subtract, you know, do logical operations and so forth. So there are actually two paths feeding the microprocessor. One, which is pretty much only into the processor for instructions, right? And then you have another one, which is actually two directions for data. Now, because of the different functionality, one, you know, instructions, and we'll talk when we start talking about pipelining and so forth, instructions have a little bit of, they have special needs that data doesn't. But once again, data gets written, instructions don't. And so typically what you do is you have a data cache and an instruction cache. You have two of them. And this has a special name. And so this is all your L1 cache, your level one cache. And then you may have your level two cache that both the data and instructions are communicating with, okay? Now, the L, there's a unified cache, this one single cache. So we have this idea of a unified cache and that means that data and instructions are stored together. They're stored in one cache. So you have a unified cache. Then you also have a split cache. And by the way, 
you look at this, you look at the type bit, right? And that type bit only occurs in a unified cache because in a unified cache, you know you could have both types of things stored there. In a split cache, however, which is what this guy is, one cache contains instructions, one cache contains data. So a cache for data and a separate cache for instructions. Wondering whether I'd be able to get all the notes for today's <laughs> for this lesson on one board. It looks like I just made it. So we have a cache for data and a cache for instructions. So this guy right here, data cache, instruction cache, that's a split cache. All data and instructions together in one cache, where you have the type bit to identify which you have. That's a unified cache. Now, not all processors have a split cache. It may be that the L1 cache is actually a unified cache, but understand that you do have the potential for separation. Now, the problem, now, now a split cache sounds really good because what we've got is it's, it's specialized, it's optimized so that it's, you know, the data cache supports data, the instruction cache supports instructions. There is a problem though. Once you split the cache, what you've done is you've said, for example, if you split it half and half, let's just say you split it half and half, that means that you expect half of your cache to be contained with data and half of it to be uh, instructions. You have, you have specified the ratio. If you have a unified cache though, depending on need, for example, there may be some processes that require a lot of instructions, very little data. Some of them where you're running small routines on large blocks of data. A unified cache is able to be flexible and change the weighting, change the ratio, change the balance of data and instructions. Whereas you don't have that flexibility with a split cache. So, you know, do you have better performance by having a split cache and it's being able to optimize for data or instructions or do you have better balance? You know, that is all up to the architect who's designed your machine, or who's designed your processor. So there you go, some additional topics when it comes to caches. And in fact, we have, as I said before, just scratched the surface. There's all sorts of topics we can continue with. For example, virtual memory. We haven't even addressed virtual memory. How does virtual memory affect the operation of a cache? Pipelining, how does pipelining affect cache? Um, and, and in fact, we haven't even talked about data structure alignment. Data structure alignment says that, well, we have only specific places that we can put our data. So for example, if I have a 32 byte or, or not, 32 bit, four byte memory uh, value I need to store in memory, I only have specific locations where I can store that so that I don't straddle blocks. Very important when it comes to the operation of our cache. We'll cover those whenever we get to some more advanced topics.